Glad to see you this morning. Grateful the air conditioning's working. I don't know if there will be air conditioning or heaven or not. I just know it won't feel like it does outside in heaven. Uh, continue to say, I said, told you that Wednesday, and I said, if I'm wrong, then the Lord can strike me down, and I'm still here. So hopefully that means I'm right in that statement. Uh, church family, we're, we continue to walk through the book of Daniel, and at the heart of Daniel, we continue to really wrestle with the application of this question. Uh, how do we as the people of God walk faithfully with God when living in exile in the midst of a broken and hostile world? We know Scripture calls us as the people of God, those who've been saved by grace through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, says that we are His ambassadors, that we are sojourners, that we are aliens, strangers living in this world, that our true home, our true citizenship is in heaven and is in the new heaven and new earth that is coming. So we live in a kind of exile in a world that is filled with brokenness. And that as a result of that brokenness of sin, there is an act of hostility against our God. And because uh, there is hostility against our God, there is hostility against us too. So how do we walk faithfully? How do we walk with hope in the midst of all that is going on? Well, part of it is we got to know where we're headed and praise the Lord. He tells us. He doesn't make it super complicated. He tells us in his word. So I invite you, if you will, turn with me to Daniel chapter 11. We're back in Daniel chapter 11. And you'll remember last week, we walked through, uh, let me back up even before last week. Several weeks ago, we started what is really the final saga of the book of Daniel. Uh, for most of the book, every chapter is its own unit, its own narrative, its own prophecy. But, but when we come to the end, it's Daniel 10, 11, and 12. In Daniel 10, we find Daniel has been, has been given a vision that afflicts him so deeply. The content of the vision and the warfare it portrays is so disturbing that it drives him to seek the Lord in prayer and fasting for three weeks. We see in that passage, an angel is uh, dispatched from God to bring Daniel understanding of this vision. And then we came in last week to chapter 11, and, and the angel is speaking, and the angel is, is walking Daniel through, explaining the content of the vision. And you'll remember, last week was a little different, a little strange, a lot of history. We walked through the first 35 verses of Daniel 11, all of which is prophecy to Daniel that for us has been historically fulfilled by the Persian kings, by Alexander the Great, by the kings of both the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid kingdoms, ultimately culminating in Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes, that, that ruler of the Seleucid kingdom that was so hostile and antagonistic and, and rageful against the people of God that he drove out. And here's, here's where we landed last week. Here's the reality. God is sovereign. And we explained this. We went back, looked at it Wednesday. What we mean by God is sovereign is he, he has all knowledge. He knows all things actual. He knows all things possible. He has all power. So he knows everything. He has the ability to do anything. And, and he is all good and, and on his throne and does the right thing. He knows what we could choose. He knows what we will choose. He knows what is going to happen both by the causation of his hand and what things will happen by the causation of our hands as he allows us a type of free will to make choices. And in the midst of all of this, here's the ultimate key last week. What God says comes to pass with flawless precision. Amen. And we walked through and we saw all of that last week. And as we come to this week, the basic message hasn't changed. Just as God who is sovereign with flawless precision prophesied and hit the nail on the head on all of this prophecy that for us has been fulfilled, today we discover that with flawless precision, all that he tells us about what is coming to pass will be fulfilled with flawless precision. So look with me, Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, it says, then the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods. And he will prosper until the indignation er, is finished for that which is decreed will be done. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor, for, nor, nor will he show regard for any other God. For he will magnify himself above them all. 
But instead, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor this God with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. He will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of this foreign God. He will achieve, he, he will give great honor to those who acknowledge him, and he will cause them to rule over the many. And he will parcel out the land for a price, or, or maybe your Bible reads, he will give out the land as a reward. Now, when you read this and in the verses that we'll, we'll read following, what you're going to quickly discover is, is, is a quick just glimpse, then the king. It, it might make you think that this is the same king that we saw come up in verse 21 and through verse 35, Antiochus Epiphanes. The problem with that is everything from verse 21 through verse 35, we can find exact precise fulfillment in the life of Antiochus Epiphanes. When all of a sudden you hit verse 36 and forward, none of it occurred in the life of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes said all sorts of boastful and brash things against God, but Antiochus Epiphanes never proclaimed he was God. He set up worship to Zeus in the temple. Antiochus Epiphanes didn't reject the gods of his fathers. In fact, he was very loyal to the gods of his fathers. We'll see in a moment that this king we're talking about, he's going to go down to the king of the south. He's going to go down to that, that Ptolemaic empire, that, that, that part of Africa, and he's going to actually conquer it in a way that Antiochus never did. So what's happened here? Well, what's happened is what we might call a prophetic foreshortening. Say, what on earth is that, Pastor? Let me give you a visual. It'd be like you and I standing, looking out at a beautiful mountain and remarking to one another, that is a gorgeous mountain. And then somebody who has better knowledge than us, who's seen it from a different vantage point, saying that's actually not one mountain. It's two mountains that are in such a straight line from your vantage point, you can't see the massive gap between them. That's what's happened here. There's two kings. One is a forerunner of the other. He helps us understand the reason Antiochus Epiphanes is given so much attention as he persecutes the people of God, the people of Israel, in a way that is unparalleled in human history by any other ruler until you get to the final ruler of this world, the Antichrist. And Antiochus Epiphanes is a forerunner, a type. He helps us understand what the Antichrist will be like. There's two kings, Antiochus Epiphanes and then the king of verse 36, whom Scripture will call elsewhere the man of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians, the beast of Revelation 13, the little horn of Daniel 7. 1 John will be the one to name him the Antichrist, capital A. They're right there. You just can't see, the, you just don't perceive the massive gap between them. So we've taken this gap. All of a sudden, verse 35 ceases things that have already been. And now in verse 36, we're reading about stuff that is yet to come to pass. And here's what it says, that there is a king, there is a ruler coming. And listen to how it describes his character. He will do as he pleases. Whatever he wants, he's going to do it. No one's going to talk him out of it. No one's going to, no one's going to stop him. No one's going to, uh, to, uh, to ultimately be able to oppose him and thwart him. He does as he wants. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God. He will put himself on par with any uh, deity. He's going to exalt himself. He's going to be boastful. He's going to make great and exorbitant claims. He's going to claim to be mighty. Not only that, but he will speak, it says, he will speak monstrous things or literally extraordinary things, things that are outrageous and dreadful. This king, and it says he's going to speak that way against the God of gods, meaning the one true God. This king is going to speak in such a way against the one true God the triune God of the Bible, Father, Son, Spirit, he is going to speak such things against God that it will go beyond anything any human being has ever spoken against God in all of history. Now understand how remarkable that is because some of you know the kind of nutso things humans have said in defiance of the one true God. He's going to go beyond all of them. That's why it says it speaks monstrous or extraordinary or dreadful things. And it says, and he will prosper. Here's the reality. This king is going to succeed. 
We know from the rest of, we know from the rest of uh, Daniel, this king is going to possess this, this the little horn he's called in Daniel 7. He, he possesses eyes. This horn is different than the others, having eyes, meaning he has an insight and a knowledge into the affairs of humanity that's beyond the most shrewd of, of humans. We know that he's got a boastful mouth. We know from, from Daniel chapter eight in describing Antiochus Epiphanes and in, in, in making the implication that this is how Antiochus was, the Antichrist will be even more so. We know that, the, that, that this king will be a master of political intrigue, deception, politics. We know that he will be loved by the masses. There will be in his day a true pull and pressure from society to embrace him wholeheartedly as the solution to all of humankind's problems. He will speak with arrogance. His pride will be so great. He'll even, he'll go so far, not just as to conquer the world, but to try to completely reorganize the calendar around himself, according to Daniel 7. It says that he's going to set himself against the people of God. We, we know from Daniel chapter 9, he's going to enter into a covenant with the nation of Israel, a covenant of peace. And halfway through, three and a half years into that covenant, he will break it. He will step into the temple and commit the abomination of desolation. He will claim for himself deity, not deity, not loyalty to another God, but himself as, as deity. And he will begin a persecution of the people of God that scripture describes, and we'll even see it here in a moment, as unparalleled in all of history. And it says all throughout Daniel, it says that he will be successful in this. He will set himself against God's people, Daniel 7. He will wear them down. He will wear them out. It will say elsewhere that unless God had come and intervened, this king would have destroyed God's people. Now, I give you that long explanation to say when it says, and he will prosper, understand, church family, the weight of that statement. He's going to succeed. He's going to succeed in ways that no one has ever succeeded prior to him. But even then, here's a little note of hope. He will prosper until, until the, the indignation, the time of wrath is finished for that which is decreed will be done. He will prosper. But even in his exercising a power and dominion unparalleled by any human being in history, even his power will be cut short by the dominion and power of the one true God. At the right time, right on time. I will come back to that. It says he will disregard the gods of his fathers. Now it's an interesting statement. You can translate gods there, lowercase g with a plural s, or you can translate it capital G, no s. It's led some to say that this antichrist may very well be of Jewish descent. Some would say even of the tribe of Dan. Some would, would argue that he, by virtue of, of being one of the horns that comes out of the fourth empire of Daniel, that would be the Roman empire. He is likely of some kind of Western or European descent and would have a Christian background, or it could be the other. Here's, let me tell you, Yes, could be. <laughs> Here's what it says. It says that whatever his ancestry is, the religion of his ancestors, he will completely reject. Not only that, but it says, it says, um, for he will reject, he will disregard the desire of women, which reads a certain way. The ESV translates it in a way that's maybe a little clearer. Uh, he will disregard the one beloved by women. The context here is not dealing with uh, what are his romantic desires. The context is dealing with his worship. How does he relate in religion to God? It says he disregards the God of his fathers and that statement, the one beloved, the one desired of women in, in Jewish circles at that time. Well, who, who, is, who is the one who's beloved and blessed of all women? The mother of the Messiah. To say he rejects the, re the, the desire of women means he rejects the one true Messiah, Jesus Christ. Not only that, but it says he doesn't just reject the God of his ancestors. He doesn't just reject the one true Messiah. He rejects 
all false gods. He rejects all of the gods of humanity and instead he will magnify himself. He will set himself up as God. And by the way, from what we know in the rest of scripture, he'll make a pretty convincing case to the world that he actually is. He's gonna conquer who he says he's gonna conquer. He's gonna have some supernatural power to do some miraculous things that are going to lull and, and, and pull people in. This is why he is called the Antichrist. He stands against Christ and is an interloper seeking to take people away. Instead, he will honor a God of fortresses. Now, it's an interesting little statement in, in, in every, and I read scholars and theologians of all different kinds, shapes and sizes and, and views here, but every single one of them has said the same thing, which is that, that when it says a God of fortresses, it's referring to a, a God of absolute warfare. It's possible Warfare, certainly we know he's gonna to go to war and he's gonna do everything he can to honor, uh, to, to, to go to war. We know uh, even from the passage here in a moment that he will exercise control over essentially the entire world. Uh, it's possible, here, here's the real simple point. Remember, this is prophecy that's yet to be fulfilled. And whenever we're looking forward to prophecy, we always have some question marks. And so we need to stay humble in those question marks we know God will bring it to pass with flawless precision, so let's stand on what's clear and where there's some question marks, let's, let's be humble and not get ourselves into danger like the first century world where they had all this prophecy about down to the dating of the Messiah's appearance and nobody was waiting for him because you can be so arrogant in your knowledge that you miss. So we want to be humble. Here's the simple point. This king, this ruler, the Antichrist, he is going to set himself up as God and he is going to rule a war machine that will bring complete and total destruction to this world and captivate it all under his control. That's what he's saying. Not only this, but those who acknowledge him, it says those who acknowledge him, he's gonna give preferential, he's gonna give preferential favor. Those who embrace him, he's going to give, uh, he's going to, to give power. It's gonna cause them to rule over many. It says this, he's gonna take over the land and either sell it at a cheap price. He's gonna take land that's not his from peoples it belongs to and either sell it at a price to those who are loyal to him or just flat out give it as a reward to those who are loyal to him. This is the character of the Antichrist. But it doesn't stop there with just his character. It goes to his, his dominion, his conquest. Look what it says. At the end, talking about the end times, the king of the south will collide with him and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, let me read it this way. The king of the south will collide with the Antichrist and the Antichrist, who is the king of the north, will storm against the king of the south with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He will enter countries, overflow, and pass through. Here's what it says, that, that in that final period of time, which is marked at the beginning by an entrance into a peace treaty with the people of Israel, that in that period of time, the king of the south, a coalition, uh, best we can tell, a coalition likely of, of African nations is going to come against the Antichrist and his rule. The Antichrist is gonna take the, the modern weapons of warfare of this day, here symbolized by chariots and, and horsemen and many ships. He's going to go to war against the king of the south, against this conglomerate of, of nations out of Africa, and he's going to do what all the Seleucid kings never could do, the, the previous kings of the north never could fully win. It says the Antichrist is going to go down there and his, his victory is gonna be so mighty, he will just pass through countries like an overwhelming flood, unchained, just taking over anything and everything. It says he will enter the beautiful land, that's the land of Israel, many countries will fall, these will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost, or a portion of the sons of Ammon. Then he, the Antichrist, will stretch out his hand against other countries. The land of Egypt will not escape, but he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. And Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. But rumors from the east and the north will disturb him. So he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and to annihilate many. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Here's, here's what it describes. It says that at a certain point there at the end, there's going to be a battle 
or a conglomerate of nations, we, seems to be African nations based on the rest of this text, come against the Antichrist. He's going to go down, and in the process of winning this victory, he's not just going to beat them, but he's going to enter into many countries. By the way, many, let's give us some perspective here. There's 197 nations recognized as countries today. Now, there's some more territories and things like that, but as countries, there's 197 nations. I know that because you can go online to Sporkle, which is a quiz site, and you can name them all. Sometimes that's what I do when I need a mental break, and it's weird, and I acknowledge it, but there's 197 countries. Many is not somebody conquering one or two. Many is somebody conquering dozens upon dozens. Many is not someone attacking a singular nation on the other side of the world. Many is someone attacking and conquering entire continents. It says he will go down, Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia. He, he, he will so thoroughly conquer them that they will submit at his heels. And not only that, but all the storehouses of their treasure, whether that's literal gold and jewels or maybe that's oil, all of the storehouses of their treasure, he will have complete and total control over. It'll be at this time he enters into the land of Israel and thinking he's won everything, he's going to hear some rumors out of the east and out of the north, and he's going to go out. Those rumors are going to incite a, a wrath and a rage that leads him on a warpath of absolute destruction. And in the course of this time, it says he will set his royal pavilion, meaning his capital will be in between the seas and the holy mountain, to be the Mediterranean Sea and that waterway of the Sea of Galilee down the Jordan River to the Dead Sea, you know what's right in between those, the Holy Mountain, that is Mount Zion, that is Jerusalem, where he will make his capital. We know from Revelation chapter 13 and its description of the same ruler, the Antichrist, they are referred to as the beast. He will exercise dominion essentially over the entire known world. pretty bleak picture. Remember, church family, God is sovereign, and every last word he says will come to pass with flawless precision. So everything we have just read and I have just explained to you is not some opinion. It's not some possibility of one way the world could come to an end. It is going to happen. Are you amen? And this is horrible news. Here's the amen. Yet, he will come to his end Amen. and no one will help him. Amen. Here's the absolute amen. This ruler is going to arise. The world is going to go from bad to worse, from worse to worst. And at the height of human wickedness and sin, when a human ruler who quite literally is Satan incarnate with the full backing of all of the demonic host behind him, might in the physical realm, might in the spiritual realm, at the height of his power and dominion. It says in 2 Thessalonians, with a breath, God will obliterate him. Amen. Just visualize this for a second. The whole world in captivity to a wicked ruler, all of that ruler's armies out there on the battle lines, and Jesus goes, whew, and it's done. Amen. It's over. You know why? Because God is sovereign and exactly what he says will come to pass. Amen. The ruler's gonna arise, some things are gonna go bad, the people of God are gonna suffer, and then Jesus is gonna come back. And he's gonna take the beast, defeat him with a breath, and throw him and throw Satan and throw all the other powers of wickedness in the lake of fire. Why? Because God is sovereign. God says it because he knows he can do it and he's gonna do it, which is why he says it. Now at this same time, look what it says. Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people who is found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. 
and those who lead the many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. Here's what he also says. He says at that time, and remember to Daniel, Daniel, you've, you've had this vision of all this disaster coming upon God's people. I'm explaining the, the reality of the vision you've seen. Now at that time, Daniel, at that time of the end, at that time when it seems like all hope is lost, at that time where there will be some believers either because there's not a rapture before the Antichrist or there is a rapture, but then people come to faith in Christ during the seven years of tribulation. Either way, there's gonna be some believers who are suffering. It says here that they are, they are suffering a distress such as never occurred since nations started. Jesus will describe it as a suffering never before seen in world history, Matthew 24. There's gonna be believers who are really suffering, who are really dying who are really being hunted, and they're gonna be praying for protection and God to move, and it's, it might seem practically like all hope is lost. And it says at that time, Michael, the archangel, the prince of, remember, he's talking to Daniel specifically about the people of Israel, the prince of your people who stands guard, he will arise because hope is not lost. And it says, at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, we've seen that term, the book. There's a book of truth in which God has, in his foreknowledge, written out all the course of human history. We know from Revelation that at the time of judgment that people will be judged according to their deeds, written in the books. We know that anyone whose name is not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. It's those whose names, according here, those whose names are written in the book who will be rescued, delivered. Church family, God is sovereign. What he says comes to pass. There's gonna be a real antichrist who brings a destruction and devastation upon this world unforeseen in all of human history. Yet he will meet his end by the very power of God. Here's the reality, church family. Believers are gonna suffer. and they're gonna be rescued and delivered completely. That those who's found, here's the reality, church family, when you respond to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, when you trust the person and work of Jesus Christ, in that moment, something happens. You and I are born into this life, sinners by nature, not Christian, not in a relationship with God. We're born sinners by nature. Out of that nature, we sin. We commit deeds and acts of sin, the punishment of which is death and not just dying a physical death, but it is an eternal death, according to Scripture. And somewhere along the way, it says that the Holy Spirit is, convicts our hearts that we're a sinner, we're outside of a relationship with God, that Jesus, who is God, came, stepped down out of heaven, lived the life of human righteousness we have failed to, that He died the death and received the punishment we rightly deserve, that he rose from the grave and can actually offer us his righteousness as a gift of grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't work our way to it, that he, he offers this. And when you and I come to that point of conviction and hearing this gospel message, and we say, Jesus, you're right, I'm wrong, save me. I need you to be my savior so I can know you as my Lord and sit at your table as my father. When that moment happens... The blood of Jesus is applied to our account, washing us who are filthy, white as snow. When that moment happens, the whole of eternity in our heart, the Holy Spirit, God himself, the third person of the Trinity comes in to live in that space and seals us permanently, meaning he can't go out, we can't be lost. In that moment, oh, you're all of a sudden seated in the heavenly places at the table of our God and Father because we've been adopted as sons and daughters. But at that moment, something else happens. There is a book. And in that book, in ink that I believe is stained with the blood of Jesus, your name and my name are written. Got some great news for you about salvation. There's days where you may be living, doing a really crummy job of being a son or daughter of God. But if you are truly in Christ, your crummy days don't dictate your name being in that book. 
He wrote your name in that book with his own blood. Your, net, your salvation is not dependent upon you and your performance, it's dependent upon Christ. Here's what it says, that everyone whose name is found written in that book will be rescued. It says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. That those who have died, sleep here is an imagery for death, they will awake, they will come back to life. Now pay attention to what it says because we're prone to forget this. It says, everyone who's fallen asleep will come back to life, some to everlasting life, others to everlasting disgrace and contempt. Now, give you a summary here. When you turn back over to the book of Revelation and it describes the final events, here's what it tells us. It tells us that when Jesus returns, well, actually, it's bigger than Revelation. It says that the trump will resound, that those on earth will look up, they'll see Jesus on a white horse descending with the angels behind him. It says they will look around and the dead in Christ, those who have died but are saved, whose souls have been in heaven, they will be brought back to their bodies. Their bodies will be raised from the ground and they will be lifted into heaven. Those who are alive and in Christ will be lifted into heaven, lifted into the skies after them. They will meet Jesus in the sky. Paul says in, in Corinthians that in that moment, in a, blink, a blinking of an eye, and a, that our bodies will, will, will go from being mortal and perishable to immortal and imperishable. It says in 1 John chapter 3 that our bodies will all of a sudden be made like Christ's resurrection body. And it says in Revelation that this first resurrection of the dead is for those who are in Christ and are saved. And they will, we will, we who are in Christ, we will be raised at that moment, reunited our souls with our resurrected body, and we will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Amen. Woo! Oh my goodness, it's not one possibility, it's what's gonna happen. But it also says that at the end of that thousand years, the rest of the dead who have not come to faith in Christ, they will rise. Now they will be reunited with their bodies, not a resurrection body like ours that is immortal and imperishable, but they will be reunited with what we would use the term, just their body being reconstituted. And it says they will go to everlasting contempt and disgrace. Now catch this, for someone who rejects the offer of Christ, they will suffer spiritually and physically. And it says for all eternity. Now some will say, because that's a tough statement to, to grasp, well, somewhere down the line, God will just take them out of existence and annihilate them. You can't do that. Because this pas pa passage puts in parallel, some are raised to everlasting life, some are raised to everlasting disgrace. If everlasting disgrace means only everlasting till God decides to snuff it out, then everlasting life means the same thing. They're in parallel. No, church family, if you're in Christ, there is everlasting life, life beyond anything we could ever imagine that is there. And if you are not in Christ, there is everlasting torment not because God is some sadistic, twisted despot who delights. In fact, it says very clearly in the book of Ezekiel, God doesn't delight to send anyone to hell. Instead, he, he delights in people repenting and be restored to him in his grace and mercy. But God is a just judge and the just, right, and good sentence for deeds of sin is eternal death. Now we may not like that that's the just sentence, but it doesn't change the fact that it is. It says those who have insight, doesn't just say that they will be ri rise to resurrected bodies. Those who have insight will shine. There will be a glory. Those who lead many to righteousness, there will be a glory that is there. There, there will be a glory, a, a glory that First Peter describes God taking even the hardships and pains and sorrows and struggles of life now. He is preparing us, refining us to receive that glory that, that it's not just at that moment we'll all bow and see the glory of Jesus. We will, but in the same token, Jesus delights, 1 Corinthians 3, to reward the faithful lives of his, of his servants lived by the sufficiency of his grace and the overwhelming reality of his power that he delights to reward to bring a glory 
It says to those who have insight. What do I mean by insight? Understanding, wisdom. I mean people with the insight who, who know who God is, who know how God acts, who know what God is up to, what he's doing, what his plans and purposes are, that, that those who have insight will shine with glory. We see in the previous verses, back in verse 32 and 33, that those who have insight, that they stood with strength because they knew God truly, that those with insight, they took up action to do the right things. Those with insight went out and tried to bring other people to understanding. Those with insight... And you go, well, pastor, what do we do with all of this? If, if we know all, look, look how God's word came to pass. Every last thing he said last week happened. This week tells us, this week tells us some real realities. It tells us the antichrist will come. It tells us the world will suffer. It says the people of God will be persecuted. But it also says God will destroy the power of the enemy. And God will deliver his people right on time at the right, at the right time. It says Jesus will return and rescue his people and vanquish all evil. Evil's defeated. The righteous are raised. The redeemed are glorified. This is what it says will happen. So I got news for us, church family. It's going to happen. And if you're in Christ, we're going to see it happen. Either from the vantage point of here or the vantage point of heaven coming back down with Jesus. So what do we do with that knowledge, church family, very simple today. If we really understand that God is sovereign and his word comes to pass, and here's what his word says will come to pass, then if we really understand that, we have to live as people of insight. Now, we're going to look back at what it, this means next week. Insight, the application of living as people of insight really is the application last week, this week, and next week. So today, I just want to hone in on one simple truth. If we're going to live as people of insight, it means we have to live hoping in the certainty of his deliverance. You catch what Daniel, what the angel tells Daniel, Daniel, here's what's going to happen. This king is going to rise, uh, going to rise. It's going to be bad. It's going to be rough. The people of God are going to suffer. And by the way, can I just give you a point of truth, a point of note? We're not living in these days yet. We're not. I can't tell you that with certainty. We might be getting close. We might not be getting close. That's not for me to know God hadn't told me. What I do know is we're not there yet because the Antichrist hadn't stepped on the scene and there hadn't been a peace covenant with Israel happen yet. So we're not there yet. But let me be clear, because there are a lot of charlatan preachers running around in our country today who act, if you really know Jesus, whatever you pray for, if you just pray hard enough and right, he's going to give you. That if you just follow Jesus well enough, health, wealth, and prosperity are going to follow. Some do it boldly, and with those words, some hide it and couch it in other terms. Can I be clear today, church family? If you are in Christ, you have no guarantee that you will not suffer in this world. You follow the suffering servant. You know what you have a guarantee of? That you're gonna experience suffering and hardship in this world. Here's what I mean practically. It means every Christian is gonna get sick. And as Christians, we're gonna pray. Some God will heal, some God will not in this world. You're going to face situations. God, everything seems to be falling apart. I feel like you're silent. What's going on? Where are you? What's happening? And some things may, in fact, fall apart from this earthly perspective. It doesn't mean anything's wrong. There may be multiple things God is or isn't doing in that place, working in your life, through your life. But I want to be clear today, church family. We, as the people of God, will live in a world where we will not be spared suffering. In fact, if anything, we will be exposed to a greater suffering if we actually follow Jesus at his word. Now you go, man, that's tough. That's, that's hard. Yes, which is why it's necessary. If you and I are going to walk faithfully with the Lord in a world of exile, it has to be as people of hope. And hope is not hope of this world, which is a feeling that what I want might happen that lacks both certainty and objectivity. It says, well, something might be possible and it's only possible if I want it. That is not hope. Church family, we live in a world where the living God acts and intervenes in human life. And he can be trusted to implement his promises. Hope that is biblical 
is possible. It is certain. It's not a matter of temperament or condition by circumstances or possibilities. It's not dependent upon what we possess or upon what we might be able to do for ourselves or what any other human being would do. Hope is hope because what God has done in the past in preparing for the coming of Christ and because of what we know he's doing now and working through Christ and what we know he's going to do in preparing for the return of Christ. Hope is hope because it is certain. And this passage tells us that there is a certain reality. You and I will face suffering, we will face hardship, and make no mistake, if we are in Christ, we will also experience complete and total and full deliverance. Our body may give out this side of heaven and we will be delivered safely home by Jesus Christ. In heaven, we will know the joy and intimacy and pleasure of being with our Lord. When the Lord returns, he will resurrect our bodies. He will make them new. They will be perfect. They will be glorified. We, our soul will be reunited with it and we will live forever in eternity, not in those bodies in this world, ultimately those bodies in a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more sin, no more tears, no more fighting, no more funerals, where Jesus takes his nail-scarred hands and wipes the tears away from our eyes. That is certain for those of us in Christ. So church family, understand our hope and joy must never rest on the state of the economy, the outcome of an election, the direction of the culture, the noise of the news cycle. Our hope has to rest in the knowledge of his plans and purposes. He is going to do what he says. Maybe our hope is weak because we've believed in what we want him to do. This idea that, oh, prosperity, God, you're just going to bless everything in my life. No. God may bless many things in our lives, and God may not. That's his choice, that's his prerogative. Our job is to know him, to love him, to follow him, to trust him, to hope in him. Church family, there must be a real, tangible, palpable, radiant joy and hope in our lives that can only come when we rest upon the secure rock of a sovereign God's deliverance. It's our hope that Peter says, be prepared to give a defense, not for your ethics, for your hope. It's our hope. It's our hope that Paul says in 1 Thessalonians is a protection like a helmet for our, for our heart and mind spiritually. It's hope. Paul tells us, you want to know hope real in your life? Meditate. Meditate on the Word. Romans 12, 12. Romans 15, 4, rejoice in hope. Make decisions in light of what is coming for it will not disappoint. Romans chapter five. Now listen, I'm not trying to give today to our pain and suffering the band-aid of heaven. The band-aid of heaven is when something really sorrowful, truly sorrowful has happened in your life and someone comes around and says, hey, just remember God makes it all work for good. Dry your eyes. You're right, my God does make it together for good. And the reason when I face suffering that I can go to the pit of grief and weep is because my Jesus passed through that pit long before me and came out the other side, the victor. The band-aid of heaven doesn't take away my tears. It enables me to actually cry my tears with a savior, a sovereign God who weeps over me, who keeps track of my tears in a bottle. It is for this reason we grieve with hope according to Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Having this hope doesn't mean that we don't have any concerns in this world or that we don't feel any feelings of fear. Listen, there's stuff you and I should be concerned about. There's things that are going to make us feel afraid. What it does mean to have hope is a confident determination and purpose filled with joy as we live our lives in light of His coming. It is not a ground for laziness. Well, he's gonna come back, why, why do we do anything? No, people of insight, they stand with strength, they take action. It's interesting, church family, when you look at a lot of stuff, a lot of movies in the last decade, there is a very prominent theme, so much so that it's even verbatim stated, it's hope, it's hope. I can take you through tons of different movies, but I'll give you one example. Uh, they released a Star Wars movie several years back called Rogue One. It's, it's like a prequel to the original movies. 
And in it, they're having this whole debate on what to do. There's this massive weapon that can blow up entire cities and, and come to blow up entire planets. What do we do? Well, we should just run and hide. And they're having this intense scene and they spell it out right there. And the main character goes, hope. Hope is what rebellions are built on. The whole movie is about hope. And here's the irony. The whole movie is about hope in the sense of it's possible if we do what's right, something may happen. Church family, that's not the kind of hope we're talking about. I'm not talking about it's possible if we do what's right, God may come back. I'm talking about the fact God is coming back. That the most powerful of human wickedness and rulers will be defeated with a breath. It's not something that's possible. It is something that is tangible, that is real, that is actual. Perhaps rebellions aren't born out of hope. Perhaps revival is birthed from hope. Perhaps we, church family, as the greatest witness we could give to Christ, must live as people filled with biblical hope. And the only way we're going to have the insight to do it is if we really understand with absolute certainty, history is moving to a point where the Antichrist will rise. He will come to power. He will exercise dominion and cause suffering this world has never seen. And right on time, at the appointed time, the trump will resound and Jesus will descend and go, Whew. and all of us in Christ will be reunited in a resurrected body to eternal life forevermore. I'm not telling you fairy tales or wishful thinking today, church family. I am telling you if you are in Christ, what is absolutely 100% your future. And if it's 100% our future, it has to dictate 100% of my life today. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you. You know what you're doing. You know how you're doing it. You know what you're stirring and moving in each of our lives. So, Lord, may we be faithful to respond to you and to you alone. It's to you we look, Jesus. May we not dare pass by what you are speaking to our hearts today. So, Jesus, be worshiped in this time as we respond. It's in your name I pray. Amen.